Okay, so good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're super excited to be here tonight. We have three amazing women joining us this evening, uh, two of whom are world-class athletes and one of whom is a world-class thrombosis clinician. So this is Women's Health Month and tonight's topic is women's mental and physical health and the link to VTE from the eyes of elite athletes. So with that, I'm going to introduce you to our guest tonight. So our first guest is Katie Hoff Anderson. Uh, Katie is an eight time world champion, three time world record holder, current American record holder and two time Olympian in Athens, Greece and Beijing, China. Uh, Katie earned three Olympic medals in swimming. She has also won the United States Olympic Committee Honor of Sportsman of the Year two times in 2005 and 2007. Uh, Michael Phelps is often hailed as the male Katie Hoff. Um, and Katie withstood tremendous pressure and emerged from years of effort with valuable lessons learned on what it takes to succeed and power through bitter disappointment. In 2014, Katie's career took a turn while she was making a comeback for the 2016 Rio Olympic Games. Uh, she was diagnosed with a pulmonary embolism in her right lung, uh, a diagnosis that ended her career. Since then, Katie has dedicated herself to advocacy and has joined uh, forces with the National Blood Clot Alliance. She is also a best-selling author, by the way, I loved your book, uh, and an entrepreneur that allows her to work with uh, young aspiring athletes all over the world. And in her free time, Katie is advocating members of Congress for blood clot education awareness initiatives while she's in DC. Okay, uh, next up, Tatiana McFadden. And I'm not gonna say second because that's not a word she's used to hearing about herself. So I'm gonna say next up. Uh, Tatiana is considered the fastest woman in the world. She has 20 Paralympic, medal, Paralympic medals, including eight gold, 24 world major marathon wins, including four consecutive grand slams, first place in Boston, Chicago, New York City, and London marathons in the same year, and has broken five world records in track and field. Uh, in January, 2021, Women's Running Magazine selected Tatiana as one of 24 Power Women of the Year. Just one month prior, she graced the cover of the magazine's gratitude issue, sharing her powerful lessons of optimism and resilience. And early in 2020, she worked both in front of uh, the camera and behind the camera as a producer and star of Rising Phoenix, which I encourage everyone to watch, uh, the Netflix original drama that tells the story of the Paralympic movement through the nine through the lives of nine athletes. The film was released in August of 2020 to critical acclaim, including the receipt of two Emmys. She was named to the Forbes 30 under 30 list in 2017, selected as the best female athlete of the 2016 Paralympic Games by the United States Olympic Committee. Uh, in 2016, she received an SB award as the best female athlete with a disability and was selected by Marie Claire for the first class of young women's honors. In 2015, she received the Wilma Rudolph Courage Award from the Women's Sports Foundation. Just amazing. Tatiana, thank you for joining us here this evening. And we also have with us our third amazing uh, woman, Dr. Rachel Rosowski from Mass General Hospital. Uh, Rachel is a hematologist and clinical investigator at MGH and an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. She is the Director of Thrombosis Research and Division of Hematology, MGH and Co-Chair of the MGH Thrombosis Committee. She specializes in disorders of clotting and bleeding and works with many, many women. Uh, Dr. Rozlowski, we are so delighted to have you here with us as well. She is also the incoming president-elect of the Pulmonary Embolism Response Team Consortium called PERT, which is an organization focused on improving the care of patients with PEs worldwide. She earned her undergraduate degree from University of Pennsylvania, her medical degree from Harvard Medical School, and master's in public health from Harvard School of Public Health as well. She completed her residency at Brigham Williams Hospital and fellowship in hematology and medical oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute at the Mass General Hospital Combined Program. Wow, and I'm Leslie. Okay, <laughs> on, on that note, we are going to kick off um, and just uh, Katie and Tatiana, we really want you to introduce yourself to our audience tonight so they can, little, so they can learn a little bit more about the two of you as people um, and not just as you know, athletes and also as um, blood clotters. So you know, you've both have risen to become top athletes in your field, Olympic medalists, world record holders, achievements that most of us can only dream of. 
we want to sh we want you to share your stories with us tonight, where you grew up, how you got involved in your sport, and when you knew you were different than the other athletes, because you are different than the other athletes. And then we want you to talk to us about your training, how it evolved, you know, the physical and mental training that you endured in order to really get to this pinnacle of success, which you have both achieved. So you guys can flip a coin for whoever would like to start first. I think Tatiana should go first since this is one of her first uh, pep talk. <laughs> I now I you. <laughs> You're a veteran. All right. I'm happy to start first. Well, thank you so much for having me on this um, pep talk. I'm really excited to be talking about this because, um, you know, when I was first diagnosed in 2008, I felt like it was such a shameful thing to be really be talking about and to be diagnosed with and just not a lot of research was out there. So very excited to be talking with all of you tonight and a little bit about myself. I didn't have a typical childhood growing up. I was born in 1989 um, in St. Petersburg, Russia. So during the fall of communism, I was born with spina bifida. So that's where you have a hole in your back and your spinal column is sticking out. And normally you would see surgery right after birth. But for me, that wasn't the case. It was 21 days later. Shortly after that, I moved to orphanage number 13 and they're all labeled um they're not they're labeled by numbers they're not labeled by anything specific and I lived there for the first six years of my life I didn't have any medical treatment I didn't have a wheelchair available no schooling hand me down clothes and I that's that was my norm growing up and um, I scooted on the floor walked on my hands so I can get around where all the other kids were going where wherever all the other kids were going and May sixth year changed when my mom happened to walk through that door. She was purely on a work trip and she wasn't, you know, looking to adopt until she met me. And my life absolutely changed after that. And coming to the US, a lot of first things happened to me getting involved with um, school for the first time. I had roughly between 10 to 12 surgeries because my legs were atrophied, my back due to my conditions growing up. Um, and the most important thing that really changed my life was getting involved through a local sports program in Baltimore, Maryland. And when I was doing that sports program, I did ice hockey, wheelchair basketball, swimming, downhill skiing. And I also tried wheelchair racing for the first time. And I just loved it. I didn't know if it was the need for speed as a young child, but I just really took to it. And what I was noticing within that first year was that it was getting not only um, physically stronger, but mentally stronger. It was the first time that I could dream of becoming anything because growing up in an orphanage, you weren't taught to dream. You were just taught to survive. And I dreamed about becoming a Paralympic medalist when, I, sorry, an Olympic medalist when I was in eighth grade, finishing up middle school. It was a 2004 Olympic Games, and I was reading the newspapers and seeing it on TV. We didn't have the social media that we had today. And I told my parents, I said, I want to be an Olympic athlete. And they said, All right. So they did the research and found out where Paralympic trials were going to be. I was roughly 14 and a half at this time, one of the youngest ever to try out for track and field. And I just knew that I needed to be top three. So I made it in the 100 the 200 and 400 only. Um, and I made it to the finals in one, two, and and not the 400. Um, and I came home with a silver and bronze in 2004. And then I was um, starting high school. So in that moment in 2004, I knew that I wanted to um, do this for life and help to change Paralympic sport and to help promote it. Um, my lawsuit in high school um, really gave me my why when I had to sue my high school um, for no but money, but for the right for the opportunities for people with disabilities to participate in high school sports equally. Um, and that just really gave me a sense of purpose of I wanted to bring equality into Paralympic sport and to people with disabilities in their own community. Um, and now patients with blood clots. <laughs> Well, it's, it's been amazing. I mean, what you've done just to raise awareness, um, you know, across the board has just been amazing. So thank you. 
Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, and Katie? Yeah, so um, yeah, I just want to, number one, thank everybody for spending their Monday night with us and um, obviously means a ton to the National Blood Clot Alliance, to me, to to, to everyone on this call. Um, the more people that hear our stories, the more people that spread their own stories, uh, the more change that will happen. So just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, so my story starts, uh, so when I was five, uh, the main reason I got into swimming was because I thought that this really cool kid on the team that was eight was just so uh, such a stud. And I was like, how can I be like this kid? <laughs> and my mom was like, you can join the team. Uh, I hopped in the water. I was really small, like could not keep body fat on um, and promptly retired a year later because I was just too cold. So written to retirement at six years old. Started really missing it, but still didn't have that kind of ultra competitive gene yet. I just, at that point, I was like, okay, I miss swimming. I want to be with my friends. And I just really would love to win pink and purple ribbons, which for most people who don't know that, like pink and purple is like six and seven. Like it's nothing to write home about. Um, so I still hadn't kind of flipped a switch yet. Um, and I don't, I don't know what happened, but when I started getting into year round swimming, which is a lot more serious. Uh, I started seeing my friends beating me and I started realizing like, wait a second, like this is actually a sport. You're supposed to be competing. Yes, it's supposed to be fun, but um, you know, it's, it's an actual race. And I remember having this moment um, at nine years old that I can distinctly remember of just kind of figuring out how to push the limits and have to, how to go to a really uncomfortable place. Um, and it's crazy now looking back, realizing that happened at nine years old, but I, I remember just kind of con continuing to see like what I could do and the results just followed. Like I started beating people. I started going best times. Yes, it was painful as all get out, but it, it just worked. And I think that's what, at that point, I became addicted to that, like that process, that working hard, seeing results, making it be painful, which sounds crazy, but that's just kind of how my brain operated. And at 10 years old, I remember, I think I just turned 11. I remember watching the 2000 Olympic games, watching team USA, watching them just absolutely dominate, um, and declaring to anyone who would listen that I was going to become an Olympian. Um, and of course no one believed me, but I remember thinking, this is just something I have to do. Like, this is not a want, this is a need and I'm gonna do everything possible. Um, and I think this, I, I definitely am on the um, like obsessive compulsive, like just type A type personality. And so that really worked in my favor when it came to just working my butt off and competing in the events that I competed in. And, you know, my American record and world record was in the 400 I am, which is arguably one of the most, painful races. And, um, it just in part of just, you know, I would say my toughness and tenacity and grit. Um, I did not think that I was going to make the Olympic team four years after I said it. So I made my first Olympic team, um, right after my 15th birthday, um, and then made my second team, uh, for Beijing, uh, when I was 19 and that's where I won my medals. But my career has taken a ton of ups and downs. I've had, you know, really high highs and, and some low lows of just, you know, how it goes when you put yourself out there and you, and you strive for really great things. I would say if like there weren't downs, then you're probably not pushing the boundaries enough in anything you do. Um, and then, yeah, like Leslie mentioned, I was hit a down. I didn't make the 2012 team. Um, I just really missed the sport. I missed racing. I missed the community. Um, felt, you know, really sad that I, I was kind of closing my chapter in that way. And so really found my passion again, um, when I was making a comeback for 2016, uh, and in 2014, um, when I was racing for basically you have to, there's world championships a year after the Olympics and a year right before the Olympics. So this was going to be kind of my coming out party things were going really well. I was training in Miami. I was engaged. It was amazing. Had a new puppy who's still my puppy, French bulldog, and um, had this weird uh, pain in my right rib. Um, and I'm sure we'll, we'll delve into the details of that in a little bit, but um, ended up with a pulmonary embolism that ultimately ended my career. Well, we are so appreciative of you um, helping NBCA. You've been a great advocate for the blood clot community. So thank you for that. You know, one of the things that I'll, I'll take notice of is you seem to be surrounded by strong women. So Tatiana, your mom's 
uh, Katie, your mom, who I think was a, a athlete also, um, maybe just we'll take a little side side trip right now. The influence of them on on your careers and becoming these athletes that you are. Any comments? I mean, absolutely. My parents are like my 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 rock. Um, they believed in anything. My craziest, wildest dreams. They were like, "Yeah, sure, we're we're on board. <laughs> whatever <laughs> whatever you want to achieve, Tatiana, we're we're here." And so that's, I mean, they're amazing. And when I said I want to win all four majors in in one year, they were like, "Yep, yeah, we're ready for you. Just we'll help support your training and and traveling and nutrition, and we're we're all right here." So they're great. That is amazing, Katie. Yeah, I mean, I actually uh, posted about it for Mother's Day. My, you know, my mom um, was an elite athlete herself. She, uh, I think she's still at the third time all point scorer at Stanford in basketball. I inherited zero of her hand-eye coordination. So that was out the window, but she, <laughs> she has always uh, I mean, put me in the driver's seat. I, I think something that she showed me is just the ability to, to be strong, to be tough, but just to be very independent. Um, and that's something she just always allowed, like she allowed me to make mistakes. She was always just a listening ear. She never just talked at me, which she could have very easily done given that she was also an elite athlete. And I was just so appreciative that she let me have my own journey and my own ups and my own downs. And she was this, just there to either drive the car if I didn't have my license yet, or just be in the passions passenger seat and, and just love me and support me no matter what. And so, yeah, I mean, she's, I don't have don't have kids yet, hopefully soon, but um, she is definitely the type of, you know, mom and parent that I strive to be or will strive to be. Well, it's, it's clear they've all played a strong, you know, role and influence in your, in your lives and your career. And it's, it's great to see that female support. We love that, especially for Women's Health Month. So with Absolutely. that, I'll put it over to uh, Dr. R. Yes. I have one other question before I talk about, um, before I ask you all about uh, kind of what happened and the stories behind your blood clots. I'm just wondering, because it's also mental health month, how did you, how do you mentally get yourself to where you need to be when you're training, when you're in these races? I mean, first of all, your, both of your stories are so inspiring. I, I'm going to listen to this many, many, many times. And I just, I loved hearing about them. Um, I'm just wondering how, how do you get yourself there? What what helped you get there? Or is it in your DNA? This is such a this is such a like this is a debate I will have with someone for hours. Like, is it, you know, <laughs> is it part of your like we don't have hours, but like is you know, is it part of how your environment? Is it part like are you born with it? Like, can you develop it within someone? Like I just I just think it's so fascinating. Um, I mean, I think for me, I think it's, I, at the end of like all arguments I've had with people over this, I think it's a combination. Like, I think there's a piece of you that is born a competitor and that is just, you know, what drives you and lights your fire. But I also think that there's that environment of the people around you, your parents, you know, your mentors, your coaches, your teammates, like that plays a big part. Um, and so for me, I think like the environment piece was, you know, being on North Baltimore Aquatic Club, like there's a wall at Meadowbrook, which is the pool and it's lined with Olympians and Paralympians. And so that, I mean, that is like, that's just the norm. Like, that's like, it sounds crazy, but that's like the expectation. Like you walk on deck and you're like, oh, there's like these nine-year-olds, they walk on deck and they're like, oh, okay, like that's, that's just what you do here. You know, like it just becomes this thing that you do, which I think is just goes such a long way as it's an extraordinary feat, but kids realize it can happen to anybody. Um, and then on the mental side, I think that that having a goal, that goal, and this can be in any endeavor that is so important to you. That is, I mean, it is literally more important than like eating, breathing, like it is everything to you that has to happen first. And then everything else falls falls in line. Um, but for me that, I mean, you, both of us have said that like but early on, we were like, that's it. That's, that's what we want, you know? And, and then from there you kind of build the blocks around it to, to get to that point. Um, but I mean, I was willing to just be a savage in terms of pain, in terms of getting back up again, because that goal just kind of kept pulling me up by my, 
suit straps, no pun intended. So. <laughs> <laughs> Tatiana, do you want to add anything? I think for me, my journey, my journey within sports was a little bit different from, I think maybe most. So sports was more of a rehab for me. Um, and then I made it more, I want to make this into a career. And in 2004, when the stadium was not packed, my parents literally cheered for every single athlete in the stadium. There was only coaches and I felt like my parents and I thought, wow, like what is, what's happening with, with the Paralympics? You know, why is it not a packed stadium like the Olympics? And when I came back home, I felt like it, it wasn't celebrated. I don't think anyone even realized I like left and like brought home medals besides my high school teachers, because I had to submit like an absence form. And I thought, well, what, what do we need to change so we can recognize Paralympics for? And so for me, finding that why was really important because it helped me more on the mental side to become the best um, and do all these races and be fortunate enough to win all these medals and add on marathons on top of that and just to keep that voice going. When I was 15, I was like, I love watching the Williams sisters. And I thought, well, if Serena can win everything and she's a voice in tennis and she's changing the game in tennis, I can absolutely do that in Paralympic sport. My, I think my mental side of it really changed. Um, not a little bit during my first diagnosis in 2008 with blood clotting disorders, but when it came back 10 years later um, in 2017, which we can dive into um, yeah. later in our discussion, but so for me, that drive and that keep going, I, I love it. Um, I love the, the speed of re wheelchair racing and the technology piece is wild right now. I'm in an all carbon fiber racing chair and it's beautiful. And the racing gloves are 3D printed. My chair is 3D printed. People are going wow. much faster than I was in, in 2004. So the, the sport's like alive right now and we're watching it you know, on TV and on the socials. So it's, it's a great time uh, to be a Paralympic athlete and I love it. And I, I just want to say you, you know, you looked at Serena Williams. I can guarantee you that there are many, many, many young girls out there looking at you and viewing you in the same exact way. So I hope you realize that. So I, I want to kind of uh, talk about the next steps, which is, you know, both of you are at kind of the height of your career in excellent shape. And, and Katie, we can start with you, you know, it was 2014, you're in training, you're getting ready for the, the Olympics again. And how did you know something was wrong? And how were you diagnosed? If you want to tell us a, a, about that story. And that's Katie on the screen right now. Yes, this is Katie. You can see Hoff. <laughs> that is yeah. Quite an amazing picture. Uh, <laughs> um, yes. So I was um I was training in Miami and making a comeback. And honestly, not only had I found my passion again, but pace-wise, I was I was hitting in-season best times. I was hitting the paces I needed to in practice to go really back to where I was in the height of my career. And so I was really, really excited heading into this national championships. And so I flew from Miami to Irvine, California, uh, three, four days before competition. And I remember having this just weird, just like very faint, but weird tightness in my chest when we landed in California and not one that immediately was like, oh, maybe it's just like a chest cold or something that's coming on. And one, I don't have time for this Two, It's a chest cold. I've swum through the flu before. So whatever, um, and kind of pushed it aside and, you know, remember getting to the pool, kind of doing a little bit of a shakeout, um, just, which is, you know, 1500, 2000 meters. Normally we do like 8,000 meters to give you reference. So it was just, just smooth shake out the plane. Um, and I remember, you know, usually I could, off underwater 10 15 meters and 
I remember going to do that on the second lap and being able to barely go three, four meters and had to, had to come up and needed air. And it's, that's so bizarre. Like what, what is going on? And, and kind of, again, just pushed it off of like, okay, well, it's kind of a long flight. I mean, not that long, but like four or five hours, just flew across the country, whatever. Um, and then the next morning, I remember starting, it started developing into kind of felt like, like a little bit of like a cramp um, in my right rib area. Like, that's so strange. Like I haven't, I'm resting. I'm not doing anything to pull a muscle or anything like that. Um, and then it, it progressed, right? Like I now had 48 hours till day one of the meet each hour, literally it got more and more and from cramp to the night before the, my first race, it was like, now like, okay, there's like a knife that's kind of like poking at me. Um, and I'm, you know, popping Advil and, and going, I not knowing what to make of it. But again, like when you're in, when you're in go time mode, which is the second you get to the venue, um, you, you did, nothing matters. Like literally someone could be, you know, st stomping on my head and I'd be like, how do I get to the pool? Like, it's just that mentality. And I remember I did my first race, which was just a tune-up race for me. And it wasn't my best event, um, completely dying the last half of the race. And it just started, like, I was like, I can barely get air. Um, but again, had no idea what was going on. So I was just, just like, okay, well, I'm just going to need to deal. I just need to deal with this. And that was, you know, a, that was talking to a doctor on the, on the pool deck. So I don't even know if that person was like qualified, but just saying, he said, you know, maybe it's a strain. Did you do anything weird and warm up? And I was like, I guess I did. Um, and that night I'll never forget, we we're sitting at dinner and the pain went in. It almost felt like, I now know what it is, but it almost felt like a spasm. Like it just felt like it was just like a repeated stabbing with a knife in my rib area. Um, I like promptly got up and just started bawling in the bathroom. So I was just embarrassed. And um, mm. that, that night actually passed out because the pain was so great that I couldn't take in enough air um, to obviously have oxygen to, to stay conscious. Um, and so I don't know how far you want to go into this story, by the way. <laughs> John, that's so that's well. good. And then <laughs> okay, maybe spend another minute or two and just tell us that ultimately you were diagnosed. So yeah, so basically, uh, I, I, at that point still thought there's a five day meet. I still thought that I was going to compete and day five was my best event. And I just remember, I mean, I went, I still didn't go into the ER because, um, Tatiana know this, if you, if you don't have a TUE and you get an intravenous in, injection, whether it's water or anything, you're disqualified. Um, and so I, my husband being an elite athlete himself was like, well, I don't, well, I don't want to take her in, you know? And so we were doing, I had a turtle shot, like some random doctor. Um, I was doing massage. I was all these different things. And I remember being in the pool the night before day five and like looking up at my coach and my, it's my fiance at the time, now my husband of 10 years. And I was like, you have to tell me to get out of the pool because if I get out of the pool, I know it's done. Cause I could barely do 50 meters, like without, wow. like I really wow. swim. and they were like, <laughs> it was, I mean, it was just terrible. And so I ended up oh. out, um, flying home and then going about seven weeks of just misdiagnosis after misdiagnosis oh. and finally wow. getting my diagnosis when I demanded a blood test. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. I, that is, uh, I mean, the fact that you had all those symptoms, I think it speaks to, you know, people don't know the signs and symptoms yeah. of a blood clot and Leslie can stand up and show you her, her vest, yeah, my, my vest <laughs> but, you know, you're, you're in amazing shape. Who would think that you would get a blood clot, right? You're, you know, you're, in, you know, you're, you're, you're an incredible athlete. Um, but I, I think it does absolutely speak to kind of the lack of recognition of, of being aware of, you know, the signs and symptoms of blood clot. And thank you for sharing that. And how scary was that for you? And actually having to have somebody else force you out of the pool. I mean, just your drive to keep doing that. I mean, everything you've shared with us kind of speaks to that. So thank you for sharing that uh, really. Rachel, before you move on, Katie, I'm curious to know, how many doctors did you actually see before you were diagnosed? Because this is an issue for the patient community that we interact with a lot. They go to the emergency room, they're told it's something else and people, don't necessarily want to go back for fear of being told again that there's something wrong, even though they know there's something wrong. So 
how many folks did you actually go see before you actually got the right diagnosis? And you had to advocate for yourself. Yeah, four. Four if you count the doctor that made me hit myself on the head and said my diaphragm was out of place. Like, I don't know if he actually had, had a PhD, but um, <laughs> that was like my... So I basically like went with my primary, I got an x-ray, they thought it was pneumonia, they thought it was asthma, they thought it was intercostal strain, and I got like just speeding up all the different diagnoses, and finally I was like, all right, well, I'm going to try something different, because none of this is working, I'm still in pain, I'm still trying to swim, I'm still like, can't even sleep at night, um, and so this alternist was like, oh, like your diaphragm's out of place, like that's why, and like I always tell this story, it's like insane, but this just tells you where my head was at, desperation yeah. wise. And he was like, okay, like, you're going to like take this stick. I'm not kidding. Like you're going to take this stick and you're going to like, add, like exhale. And like, as you exhale, like hit your head and all move your diaphragm. Like, you know, the sad <laughs> part is like, I got in the car and, and called my husband and was like, babe, like that was it. Like, I think that's, I think after tomorrow I'm not going to be at it. Like I was just so like needing wow. And I find my primary is who I kept kind of circling back to. I'd like go out, come back, go out, come back. And my primary, I was just like, finally, which after talking to Dr. Klein, like at in DC, it was a simple blood test. Like it was like, is your D-dimer elevated? Like we could have done that day one, not on week seven. And that's what did it. I was like, there's something wrong with me still. He did the D-dimer test. I got sent straight to do a CAT scan and there were two blood clots in the bottom of my right lung. So like, that's the thing. It's like, it's, it's not invasive. It's not expensive. Like it literally would have taken one of those doctors being like, let's just see, let's just see, you know, all some of your symptoms. So what if you're healthy? So what if your heart rate's low? Like this can happen to anyone and let's just rule it out because it can happen to anybody, you know? So, yeah. so you, know you're, you know, your body the best, make sure to advocate for yourself if you're not getting the right answers. Yes. Absolutely. Your intuition is right. You're not crazy. Yeah. And I would just emphasize that anyone listening to this, you know, your body better than anybody else. And if you know that there's something wrong and you're not getting the right answers, don't stop at the first person. And Katie, I'm so sorry. It took you so long to get diagnosed. And we're you know so fortunate that you're an advocate now and really trying to raise awareness. Um, Tatiana, I want to go to you. I know your first book clot was in 2008, right before the Beijing games. And I'd love to hear your story of what your symptoms were, how that was diagnosed, how you dealt with that that first time. Yeah, so mine was, I come home from Japan um, in Osaka and I did a competition. It was, I think the 1500 meters and I did awful. Like I started out so strong. Uh, then you could see on like the screen. I just kept like going further back and back and back and back. And I like finished last place and I was just so winded and I was so tired. And I was like, this is just so weird. I'm just exhausted. Um, and it, I felt like I ran like two marathons that day. I just like was completely like done. Um, and then I flew home from Japan uh, to back to the U S and I started kind of noting, noticing my fatigue was still there. And I was like, wow, I'm just like, I'm not recovering and I'm pretty young and I, I should be okay. And it's been you know, a week since two weeks since I came, come back from Japan. Like I should be really like bouncing back at this point, you know, we're getting ready for trials for the 2008 games. And I thought like, this should be, you know, pretty, pretty easy to get back into. And one Saturday morning, I was like still sleeping and it was probably around like noon. My mom had come in and she's like, what are you doing? Still sleeping. I was like, I am just so tired. And um, so I got up and I went downstairs and then I noticed like the discoloration of my feet. And that was when we knew like to go to the ER. My like, my feet had gone like black mm -hmm. almost. And that's, that's when we went to the ER and my mom was uh, the one that like knew the symptoms of the of the blood clot and so that's what we told the er people and so i was able to get in relatively 
um, quickly. And I was in the hospital for about a week or two. Um, I had a stent put in. I had um, when they went in and broke up the clots. And then I also had like the catheters behind my legs um, with the medicine with the heparin in there to get rid of them. And at the time I was like, well, I'm hoping I can, you know, I'm like 19 years old. So I'm like, well, I'm, I'll be fine for, for trials. You know, this will be great. I, I have some time and maybe they'll take me as a, a medical card if I, you know, don't do as well as I hoped. Um, we did write to Team USA and, and explain my situation because I couldn't actually go to trials at that point. And um, cause my recovery was taking a lot longer. Um, so I did go as a wild card in 2008 that summer. Um, and I was really thankful of my previous year's performance, but it was uh, tough to get back into training, but I think my age, well, I know my age helped being 19 years old. Um, but the real struggle was in 2017, um, I was in training camp in February and I was going to California and I thought, wow, like, I feel like I'm getting a, maybe like a cold or, or allergies. I kind of kept coughing and, and sneezing, didn't have a fever. So when I got to the training camp, I was like, oh, can I have, like, I went to the, the medical tent and I said, can I have allergy medicine? I feel like I'm coming on with something. So I, I took that. It didn't help. And uh, I, the symptoms still uh, was, was getting a little bit worse. And then I was tired, but I was still able to train. And I still had the, the coughing and like the kind of like allergy, like a little runny uh, eyes and, um, but nothing else at that point besides added fatigue. And then the, the following day, I gained so much fluid that I couldn't fit into my racing chair. And I got in, I was like, wow, this is really tight. Like, why am I really struggling to get into this racing chair? I was like, something is definitely way off. And so I, I messaged my mom and I was like, this is so weird, but I gained like so much lymphedema that I cannot get into my racing chair. So we contacted the, we wrote my doctors, the email and said, this is kind of strange. And I looked at my feet and they actually didn't have any discoloration at that time. And so I was worried about possible of, a, of another blood clot. And during that time, you know, I was really fit, came off from the Paralympic games, um, winning everything and previous marathons, um, winning all these major marathons in a row for four years in a row. And so I thought, well, why don't I just go, you know, get it checked out. And unfortunately it was on a weekend. So Team USA couldn't get an ultrasound for that day. Uh, so I actually went to the ER uh, in California and they said, wow, you have a really major blood clot and it is uh, in your right leg. So my left leg was actually very, very swollen. Um, but my right leg was skinny. And so at that point, when I, I emailed the doctors back and I said, I do have a blood clot. So we took um, the all the precautions to get me home because uh, I wanted to be at Johns Hopkins um, with my with my doctors. And the clot, when I was able to finally come back home, the when they did the procedures, I went right right away into surgery. The the clots were um like stone. They couldn't break it up. And I was in surgery for six hours and they could not break up um the clot. So unfortunately that was really tough news when I wake up. All my numbers were absolutely off um, in the blood work. And it was probably the most frustrating time because um after that I when I came home, I was on um, a fragment, like an injection, which I've been previously on before. But then the clots came back. So I, we couldn't find the right, um, 
right dosage quite yeah they put on the dose that for my body weight but I actually needed to be a little bit higher at the time to get rid of all the clots and then my swelling was just still there tons of lymphedema I was in pain all the time um, I had chest pain and I was really worried about my career at that point because March was really tough I went in for a second procedure to look at everything to see if they could break up more of the clots um, after I was on all of the Bragman shots um, but unfortunately they still couldn't um, I couldn't even, I had to get a new racing chair. I could not fit into my old racing chair. And once, um, once I stopped clotting, I had to figure out another, um, therapeutic method for my legs because I couldn't even sit in my day chair for more than about, uh, in 30 minutes. It just, I had so much pain in my hips and in my legs getting into training. I couldn't spend more than a half hour in my racing chair, I had to do mostly gym workouts. And I thought at that point, well, I don't know what my career was going to, to, to be, uh, what was going to happen. And so I asked the medical team, I said, if I keep training, uh, how dangerous will they, will this be? And they said, well, you can keep training because, you know, you're on Xarelto now you're going to be fine, but it's going to be very, very difficult for, for you to, to get back or you, you may not feel like it for a long time, like your old self. And they were right. They were absolutely right. Um, it took me a long time to kind of, uh, work down the, the shrinking of the, of the lymphedema, um, to get back into, um, that, that racing chair. And I just had to work my, my way up from 40 minutes to, 50 minutes to an hour in, in the chair. And I tried to do the same workouts as my teammates. It couldn't happen. I could do half of the workout. Um, we're going to world championships that following year um, in, in 2018 was, was very difficult, but I just had to stay consistent. I think the, the thing that really was concerning too was um, I received um, some chest pain in, in my recovery. And that part was really scary. And gave me a lot of anxiety. Um, and again, when we talked to the, to the doctors, that was normal. Um, but I think the hardest part was as an elite athlete, um, because blood clots aren't talked about enough, people thought m- my career was absolutely done. And my situation is different from Katie's. And um, and it was, you know, that was the difficult part was hearing that and thinking, well, Titanic should be very happy that you've achieved what you achieved and all these medals that you've got, like, it's okay to stop your career here. And I thought, well, no, I, I know I have it in me. I just need to keep going. And I had to change the narr- narrative of my own story um, because it was mentally difficult I felt like I was very alone um, going through this journey and still I, until I started researching athletes. I've gotten it. Facebook messages that came into me when I shared my journey and I felt like I wasn't so alone. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think you, I, I, wow, there's just so many things that I started talking about. I, I think two things that you mentioned, because we, we had a lot of questions about exercise and when you start exercise and how you do that. And I think three of the things that you mentioned was, well, two is, is just starting slowly, you know, like you started slowly and made your way up and then just listening to your body and changing your narrative, right? Like just allowing yourself, being patient with yourself, starting again, slowly, and then getting that support that you weren't by yourself. And that is so crucially important that you're not alone in kind of that mental struggle behind it. So I I think those three things that you, that you touched on are, are really really helpful. All right. So I think we're going to, we're going to change lanes here. That's my sports uh, euphemism here. We're going to change lanes. So uh, you have um, both been very open about your mental health challenges that you've experienced because of blood clots. And um, you've both trained to be competitors, but it sounds like your toughest competition may have been blood clots themselves. 
So let's talk about how you process this. You know, do you still suffer from the emotional effects of blood clots? How do you deal with this? And, you know, so many of the people that come to us, this is one of the main topics that they bring forth is that they really suffer from, you know, the emotional impacts of a blood clot. So talk to all of us about your experience with this. And I know you're big, you're both big proponents of, of mental health awareness. So thank you for that. But um, share, share your stories here. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go mine. Mine is interesting because, you know, obviously the blood clot was really what ended my career. So I have, I think for a really long time, just had such hatred um, and resentment towards that and like still processing it to this day. Um, but I, I never imagined, you know, when the doctors told me, you know, obviously your lung capacity has been reduced. Uh, you know, it's going to be really challenging to be, you know, at, you know, the ultimate Olympic level. Um, one, I didn't believe them. I was like, okay, well, you guys have not got it right this whole time. So, um, I don't think you're right. And obviously they, they were right, unfortunately. And, but I didn't, I, I never thought that meant like, okay, well, I just can't go and just be a normal person and be fit and work out and run and lift weights. And that was something I was not prepared for. And so, you know, after my career was done, I of course wanted to be an active person and, you know, be fit and feel healthy and, and all of those things that just was such a large part of my life. And, um, I kept having these moments where, I mean, I would be doing a simple Peloton workout, like a 30 minute bike boot camp, where I would, you know, be pushing it to a limit that I thought was, you know, they're telling me to push it to, I wasn't trying to do anything Olympian. Like I was just trying to, to, you know, get a great workout in. And I would have these moments where I would push it to kind of this breathlessness that I was super accustomed to that. I'd definitely taken it way further. And I would just immediately start crying like out of nowhere. And one, my ego was like, are you joking? Like you've done three hour workouts straight way harder than this. So I, that was the first piece that I was having to overcome. And then the second piece was, I didn't understand why it was happening. Like I was, I then would go to a place of, okay, weak person, like in a much meaner way than, than that to myself. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I would be beating myself up of like, what's, why are you crying? And I, and I would just keep trying to push through. And it was ultimately my, my husband who would like walk by the room and be like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I, you know, like just, I have to keep, he's like, stop. Like it's, oh, you know, and I, I just kept having these. And I, I still have these times. I'm just, I'm better equipped because I, that's the wrong word. Not quick. I just know what it is. You know, like I'm still very upset by it, but like I've, the more I've, you know, delved into it and talked to other people, I realized like I had a full year of trying to make a comeback. And even when I had the blood clot going into that breathlessness moment, which was obviously very emotional. And so I truly have this PTSD now when I push it to this limit of breathlessness. Um, and I, like many others, I've heard people say like, well, I thought PTSD was like, you know, something like you went to war and you came back mm -hmm. and like it, PTSD can be anything traumatic that happens to you. Um, and so now I'm just, just more aware of it, but um, yeah, like I still, I'm coming to grips of like, why, why did this happen? You know, I, I don't have any markers in my blood of like, I'm, I'm totally unprovoked. I don't know why it happened. Um and, and that's just something I'm just going to have to live with. And I think the only thing for me that um, mental health wise makes it okay is just being able to make sure that it doesn't happen to other people and that other people can save their own life or save the lives of others or, you know, get back to themselves faster. Like that's my make sense moment of, okay, this is why it happened to me. Um, but yeah, it's, I still struggle with it. Did you, did you find, um, that you needed the help of a therapist or was it your family and your husband that really helped you through this or what, what kind of propelled you to the next? I mean, I know time also helps a little bit, but I don't think any of us are ever hundred percent free and clear of, you know, this kind of hanging out in the background potentially. Definitely, definitely not. Yeah. I, I would say it was actually more my family and my husband, probably my husband most, um, just because he, he was a fullback. So he had 
a ton of injuries in his career. And um, so I think he got it on that level. He also saw me go through it like from day zero to now. Um, and I never felt, I, I guess I just didn't feel like I tried therapy for uh, therapy for different things, but like for this in particular, I just always felt very misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Um, very misunderstood of just like similar to what you said, Tatiana, it's just, even for me, people are like, well, like you're, but you're alive. So like, you should, you should be grateful, like check, like that's like, I almost felt like it felt a level of guilt that I wanted more, like that I wanted to thrive beyond just being alive. And I always, it makes me angry too, because so many people, Leslie, you told me this, like that you were like, oh, can I go for a walk now? Like, can I go back and do the yeah. thing that made me, me, that make me a healthy human being? Like that fear is awful. And so, um, yeah, like, I think that that piece, um, I've just, I'm just like such a talk, talk it out person that I just talked it out nonstop. And I'll say, I'll just say it now, like, okay, like it's happening, you know, and my husband will like talk me through it. So like, I've just gotten, gotten the tools and time has helped. Um, but I think it could have been sped up if I had just known that that's like an okay and normal thing. It's part of the process. And that doesn't make me weird or a freak or, everyone else is, is also feeling that way. And it's, it's part of it and it sucks, but it's part of it. Uh, just, just having this conversation will help, you know, so many people normalizing it. It's part of the, it's part of the treatment plan, you know, is to actually deal with the mental health side of it. Tatiana, we're going to move over to you for, you know, for your input, but afterwards, I'd be curious to hear from both of you. And Rachel's going to talk about some of the work that we've done in the space what you would actually like to say to clinicians about this issue for people who are coming behind you who may need help on the mental health side, not just the physical side, but the mental health side. But uh, Tatiana, we'll, we'll let you tell your side now in terms of the mental health implications. Yeah, I think to answer your first question for, first, what I want to tell clinicians is one, you know, you're going to be okay. I thought for a while I wasn't going to be okay, um, especially with, with the chest pains and some of the symptoms. And so I think that's the first thing. And, you know, depending on the situation that it's okay to get back to exercise and to your daily activity, whatever your appropriate plan is going to be, because it, you get so afraid of, hey, what I kept telling myself was just just keep going, like, just keep pushing, just keep pushing. I'm, I'm told, you know, by my doctor that this is going to be okay. I'm, I'm on Monzeralto, like it's going to be just fine. And also to really tell patients to really stick with their medications too. Um, it's really important to take that medicine like, every single day and take it like clockwork and to also experience, share my mental side and experience with my blood clots, it was really tough. I cried a lot. <laughs> I was very emotional. I remember being at the track and I would just like sit there and just like bawl my eyes out. And my mom would come over and like, she would start crying too, because she didn't know, really know what to do. But it was just hard because I couldn't reach the speed that I was able to reach, or I couldn't do the, the training that I normally could do. And it was very, very difficult, especially during the, the time of the marathons and, and training for world championships. You know, I, I felt like I was the only athlete going through this. Um, and I really thought that my, you know, I didn't know whether if I was going to make it to the next games or after that. And the pressure was so immensely tough. And I thought, will I ever get to back to my norm. And I finally have reached my norm th this year. And wow. I was told that my recovery was going to be 18 months plus um, because of, especially with all that. So I had 20 extra pounds of lymphedema. And at the time I weighed like 115. So all that, I didn't like the way I looked. Um, and it was hard to adjust to my new body. It was hard to lose all that lymphedema, 20 pounds of it, because 
<laughs> your water is outside your your blood vessels and so I had nowhere else to go so it was in my stomach and in my face and in my arms and it was very difficult but I told myself just take it one day at a time and that's the best advice I can give is just take it one day at a time and I um, thought I saw a therapist I think it was really important to see one because for me it got too much um, and I wanted to um, and it was wonderful talking to her and, and sharing my experience and I could start journaling and doing um, mindfulness, you know, breathing was really the most important thing that I learned. That's amazing. And again, just the fact that you are both discussing this and normalizing it just will help, you know, so many, so many people. And Katie, before we move on, just, you know, would also like to get your input in terms of what would you like to tell the clinical community about these issues surrounding mental health and, and VTE? I think the number one thing is it makes a huge difference. I think that's the piece. I don't think that a lot of my doctors realized how much of a difference for them to say. I mean, it's like, it would be like 45 seconds to be like, Hey, I see you. I hear you. How are you? You right. know, like, you know, like it's crazy. And I, and I, I talk about it all the time. I'm just like, I, I can't, I can't imagine Dr. Zosky. I can't imagine like the, 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 it's nonstop. You're seeing a million patients. There's all those things that keep, so I, I don't, it's not a fault. I just think that it's, you know, it's just the nature of the game, but at the same time, that's if there's one area where it could be improved, I think that piece would make the patient feel less alone, less yeah. crazy, less, you know, and then that, that uh, snowballs right to that person being like, okay, okay. I'm feeling good today. Okay. Like I'm going to go spread, you know, my story. And I, like, it just all compounds. And it seems like such a small little tiny stone, um, you know, of the doctor or recommend the doctor recommending, Hey, you know, I I've treated another patient like you, here's a website, stop the org, or here's someone you can connect with. Like, I feel like now, like I'm being connected with other people that have gone through it. I'm like, yes, that's like what I would have loved because it would have, you know, so I just think it's, it's not some like massive grand gesture. It's, it's these little gestures that make a huge difference of seeing the person as a person and, and helping them through that, because that is from start to finish. To me, it's an incomplete start to finish. If it's just like, yep, here's your medication. Great. You're alive. Be grateful. Um, it's that, that extra step, um, that makes the world a difference. It's, it's and I would like to cool. add, oh, and I would like to add to also what, um, what Katie was saying for women who get diagnosed with a blood clotting disorder, your period needs to be talked about. Oh, yeah. yes. I know I'm bringing this on Facebook live, but it's a different ball game. Absolutely. And you've been on a blood thinner for so long. Like Stop. it should be talked about <laughs> and it should be yeah. like, we need help. And I had to talk to my male doctor, Dr. Stripe about it. And I was like, listen, we need to have a discussion <laughs> about yeah. periods around blood clots and around your cycle and training. And I'm now, you know, on a mini pill, which helps with the immense of, you know, around that time. So it's important to discuss it because it's, it's necessary as well as um, your diet, because your iron, you really need to be ahead of it. And I mean, like ahead of it by one month, because I got in, in, a, in trouble, like last year with my iron dropping so low, like to a five. And it's supposed to be like at a 50. And I noticed that my training was very difficult and very hard. But again, as elite athletes, anyone would have fallen over at that point. But as elite athletes, we push ourselves too much. So those are the two things. So like you're really. So we're going to we're going to come we're going to come back to that because we definitely do want to address this. And I was in the same camp. Nobody. And we see we see this constantly where women are just not told what to expect, they're not told anything. And then they're on a, you know, a heavy dose anticoagulant and you're like, what do I do? And the iron levels get really low and, and it definitely, that also needs to be part of, uh, part of the protocol. 
we're gonna we're gonna change lanes again, uh, and this time actually we're gonna we're gonna turn it over to uh, Rachel because she's gonna talk about the mental health aspect and clues and the work that you're doing um, because. You know, I, I think National Blood Clot Alliance and having the two of you involved in this conversation has really led the way for us to introduce this as this is part of the treatment plan for patients. So, Rachel? Yep, you're on mute. <laughs> Uh, thank you again for sharing both your stories. And, and I think, Tatiana, you're so right. And, and both, both of you, I think if your providers, for anybody listening, if your providers are not asking you these questions, as hard as it is, please bring it up with them because they may not know to ask. And Katie, you're right. People can be busy. And if you, if you have the courage to bring it up like you did, Tatiana, absolutely. And you know, in the medical field, we're actually trying to to raise these. And I think, um, you know, when people get a blood clot, the most important thing, Katie, is, as you say, is, oh my gosh, you lived, right? <laughs> we're trying to make sure people don't die and they're not bleeding from the treatments that we're giving, especially Tatiana. It sounds like you had a lot of uh, invasive therapies and some clot busters. And then besides that, you know, what's next? And and I think as a medical community, we really kind of under-recognized and under-reported and didn't realize the kind of the longer longer term implications that blood clots can have and exactly what you both were talking about, kind of, you know, your body not getting back to what you wanted to, you know, people can have physical reminders, you know, they're taking their medication uh, or they have a twinge, something that can, you know, trigger, you know, uh, uh, oh my gosh, am I getting another blood clot? And it's this like hypervigilance and it's called thromboneurosis. And so this is something that we really didn't recognize. And I think when I started off in my career, I always ask people, you know, how's your mood? Uh, and it wasn't until um, you know, a few years into my career that somebody really did talk about, you know, actually thinking about uh, ending their life. They were so, so depressed about what happened. And Katie Wright, the PTSD. And it made me realize that, wow, we really don't know a lot. And if you look at all the literature out there about kind of functional status, quality of life, pain, anxiety, depression, all of that after a blood clot, there's not a lot out there. And it's, you know, a few qualitative research studies with maybe interviewing 10, 15, 20 people. And so, uh, and so with National Blood Clot Alliance, we decided, okay, this is a real gap in care. And so um, Bill Robertson came up with the, the, the name of the study called CLUES, which is really a clinical look at the emotional suffering in blood clot survivors um, after their blood clots. And so um, we took 12 validated surveys, put them on the National Book Club Alliance website. And I've done a lot of survey work and I get excited when a few hundred people take my survey. You know, I did a COVID survey, 500 people took it internationally. I was like, Woo, that is amazing, 500 people. <laughs> and uh, we put this survey on the National Book Club Alliance uh, website. And within 24 hours, we had 650 people take the survey. And I just think that speaks to the need for this. And we are, we've are we now compiled an international group to start to analyze this. And I think this is gonna really help us truly understand what the two of you have been talking about and really start to help us think about how we can incorporate this into clinical care across, like anybody treating people with blood clots need to incorporate this into their, into their thinking and into their post VTE, you know, post clotting clinics and things like that. And so we really are making a huge effort to do this. And just to let you know, there's actually um, two things. There's an international consortium of health outcome measures that took about 25 experts from around the world. And we spent a year, we had patient experts on this panel, a year thinking about what are the most important things we need to ask patients. And there's a whole section on quality of life and satisfaction with treatment and how your life has changed and pain and anxiety and depression and all the, and functional status. And so we are starting to ask patients these questions, which is, which is really, really important um, because, and I, and I think the other thing to remember is, and both of you said this was not feeling alone. You know, you're not crazy. <laughs> you don't have an underlying, you know, mental disorder. This is a trauma that happened to you. You experienced a trauma and having to figure out how to, how to maneuver that, right. How to, you know, Tati, you even said like changing your perspective on things, changing your narrative, but just knowing that you're not alone. And Katie, what you said, you know, just having your doctor say, just what, how are you doing? And you're not doing well. I, I hear you. And you're not alone. And here are some resources and here's where you can go. And I would say that Stop the Clot, National Book Club Alliance has a ton of resources for people. So anybody listening 
who's experienced what Tatiana or Katie has in any way, shape or form, any kind of, you know, um, uh, post um, clotting mental status, uh, psychological quality of life, functional, anything like that. There's lots of resources. And I wouldn't stop if you're, if your provider's not asking you those questions and you don't feel comfortable bringing it up, there are resources out there and I, I would not stop. Um, and again, just know that you are not alone. <laughs> That's really, really, really important. You know, and I think they, as a patient, it's really important that you think of your doctors as your team and you want to have really good teammates. And if you don't feel comfortable with your teammates, it's okay to swap out your team and trade them for another teammate. And I can say that I did that and it was hard, you know, initially because you're trying to grapple with what's happened to you, but it made a world of difference for me in terms of really getting, you know, my life back on track and for everybody who's out there, they should feel comfortable. They need to make a change. You make a change because it's about your health, both physical and mental. Yeah. And both of you have been incredible advocates for yourself, but also for all blood, all blood clot survivors. So if people can, you know, take a little bit of your courage and, uh, and, and, and use that. Um, and just, again, I think the main, main message is you're not alone in this and no matter how you're feeling, it's, it's real for you. And if you don't, someone's not listening to you or they're not asking the right questions, just keep looking. All right. So we're going to, we're going to change lanes again. We're doing a lot of lane changing here. And I know we're running late also, because this has been amazing and, um, uh, nobody's leaving. So we're going to keep going if you guys are all right with this. So um, we're going to have a kind of a group conversation between the two of you and Rachel, because we want to come back to Tatiana, what you were talking about, mm. so, you know, with women and after they've had a blood clot, you know, people want to start exercising again. You know, what did they do? What are the questions to ask? Um, you know, what words of wisdom do you have for some of these women? And then, you know, training after a clotting event. I know, Katie, you're coming up, but you're going to be running the New York City Marathon soon. And um, Tatiana, I think you're racing in Chicago soon. So, you know, guys, you're back out there again. And you know, how do you deal with being on anticoagulant and dealing with menstruation or INR or trauma related to your, to your sport? Yeah, I think that was the, the difficult um, part was the, the information that was out there and especially um, because, you know, we, there's not a lot of information that was really quite out, I felt like in 2017. So again, I'm really happy that we're here and discussing and now that there's people can go online and they can have a support system or like Facebook groups even more now. Um, it was pretty hard getting back into training. It was scary. Felt like, am I doing, am I making the right choice by going back to the sport because I want to continue. Um, and it was also um, painful too, because you felt like you were out of breath. Your muscles felt so heavy. They felt really stiff. And I felt like I constantly needed to like warm up, you know, like get my, my body kind of going. Um, but my Best advice would be, um, I saw a comment on there for someone who's 12 years old and, and is struggling that one, you are really not alone. This is much more common than what we think it is. And that, you know, there are great medicines out there now and that new research um, that you will be fine getting back into exercise. And I think that's the biggest misconception because when I was diagnosed. And when I was talking about my training online, so many people wrote to me that said, I got a blood clot, but I never went back to the gym or I never ran a race because I was afraid or, or the pain, or I, I, I just didn't know what to do. And getting back into training full-time, it was difficult. Uh, but when I was told how long it was going to take to recover, I just had to Right out the process. And it was very hard. It was very, very hard watching my competitors get faster and me still recovering and not getting any faster. But I knew that if I was patient and if I took the right recovery steps, stayed on my medication, 
I did Norma Tech. Um, they pumped my legs to get rid of some of the lymphedema. Um, Mass General helped me out with that therapeutic technique. Um, and they just kept adding on every single day, but my training did had to change. You know, I couldn't do the big volumes that I used to do. So I had to break it up into two smaller sessions and it did take time. And that's why I had to just learn to accept and just say another race, another day, and just take small things that were good that day and just continue um, with my training. But training around my cycle was very difficult especially being on a blood thinner. And also I gained a little bit of lymphedema around my cycle. And so I do have to change my training that week if I'm training versus competing Mm -hmm. um, and making sure that I'm taking the iron and checking my iron monthly as well. And I would just comment, first of all, thank you for sharing that. And I would comment on two things. What you just said is being patient. And it's so important that you're patient with yourself because you're not going to get right back into where you started, left off and then just starting slowly. And, you know, and you can start with any activity. It can be walking even, and you start slowly and it may be very tempting to return back to like where you think you want to be. But I think what you said is just having a little bit of expect different expectations, being patient and starting slowly uh, and then working your way up. And the exercise is not only going to help you prevent another blood clot from happening, but it's so good for your overall cardiovascular health, strengthening your heart, improving your circulation. And in fact, Tatiana, you said that exercise is what gave you, allowed you to be physically and emotionally stronger. So exercise is so important after, after blood clot. It wasn't easy though. (laughs) It it wasn't easy. (laughs) Let me tell you that it wasn't definitely not easy, especially working up to a marathon. uh, Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Amazing. But we got there eventually. <laughs> but doing it in pieces, like you were saying, you know, twice a day or smaller sessions or whatever it is, like working up to that and just, you know, having the ability to think out, okay, maybe today is tough, but it might be different in a month or three months or 12 months, I think really helps people get into that frame of mind to start exercising. Even if it's, I walked in my apartment, you know, that was my exercise mm-hmm. for a while, but just getting mm-hmm. up and, and doing something. Katie, to add to the conversation, any? Um, mine's tough because <laughs> I'll, I'll take it from like after my sport because I mean, it, it, it didn't get better for me for, you know, it didn't improve for a full year. There was no improvement. Um, and I obviously the, just the misdiagnosis, I think was just because the, that was the piece too, like the scar tissue build up because they were just in my lungs for two months. Like no one really talked about that piece until like way later. So I think one, the biggest lesson of all of that, and I carry it now into like just working out in general is just being kinder to yourself. Like I think every single time something like that would happen, whether it was in the pool and then I retired or, you know, anytime I'd have an episode um, where I'd push it and then have this breakdown. I was just, just, just pummeling myself. Like you're weak. Like what's wrong with you? Like other people have like gotten back on faster, which is like, that's like from zero information, by the way, that's just like me coming up with that story in my head. And so, uh, I think like that definitely being patient, but like being, and says all the time, he's like, stop being so like, you stop beating yourself up, like give you yourself some grace here you know like the fact that you're even going and trying one big takeaway if anyone is struggling or um has gone through it yeah yeah and I do think it is important to talk to your healthcare provider just to make sure that you're ready to start exercising you know you want to get you want to get clearance but and I think Katie what you said is just you know you know your body really well and it's sometimes really hard to yeah. you know you may not get completely back to where you were before. And that's a real, that's a real challenge and a disappointment. And I just thank you for sharing that. That's, <laughs> I think that will mean a lot to people who might be feeling the same things you are. By the way, I see your workouts that you post. So, um, <laughs> you're being kind and my being kind, I think are two different definitions. <laughs> Both of you actually. So, um, okay, so we have run over, but we do have some 
questions that have come in actually a lot and we're just not going to get to everybody so Wait, policy. Leslie, before, before you do the questions, I just want to mention yep. what Tatiana said about her period, because I, I don't want to leave that. Yes. And um, I do think, so this is also a question that if your provider is not asking you, it's so important because a lot of times women might get a blood clot and they were on an oral contraceptive to help with their period. And so a lot of times they'll stop the oral contraceptive and then put you on an anticoagulant. So that is like a double whammy, right? Because you're on oral contraceptive for heavy periods. Now you're off and now you're on an anticoagulant. I usually tell people, you know, expect about a maybe 10, 15% increase in their menses during that time. And if it's more than that, to really let me know. And it's also important to let your providers know what your menses were like before the anticoagulant, because if they were really heavy, putting you on an anticoagulant, you're going to need something else. And there's lots of different strategies to use when people are on anticoagulant. And I think also a lot of times in this country, people would get a blood clot and we would immediately stop the anticoagulants. There's actually data to suggest now, if you're on the anticoagulant, you can stay on the oral contraceptive while you're also on the anticoagulant. And there are certainly anticoagulants that are safer um, for people that have had blood clots. But I would, again, if you're listening to this webinar to really if your doctor's not bringing it up or your provider's not bringing it up to bring it up, because there are a lot of different strategies you can use uh, to deal with the heavy menses. And exactly what you said, Tatiana, you should not, I mean, no one should ever have to have their iron drop to five because you know, you're exhausted and you can't function and we can prevent that. So this is entirely preventable by having this conversation. Um, and we, as a medical community, do need to do a better job. And you can help us by, by bringing it up if it's not brought up. So thank you for sharing that. Okay, so we're gonna go through some of these, some of these questions. So um, let's start with, uh, how do you return to competitive sport? I was a D1 swimmer and can't seem to even return to the pool or any kind of activity. That's a great question. Maybe Katie. That is a great question. Um, that one's tough to answer because there's just so many factors involved. Um, I mean, one, number one, like working with your doctor, talking to him, making sure you've exhausted all tests. Like I had my, my charts and my blood work and like, I mean, it was shipped all over the world. So just, I think that number one, like make sure that you know, every answer that is humanly possible out there about what's going on. Um, hopefully you find some answers about why it's not improving. Um, like for me, my, I still think this is the case. I don't know if it's for sure, but my thymus gland was twice the size as it was supposed to be. It's supposed to shrink. And I had to have, because I kept pushing, they removed it. Um, it still didn't, I don't know if it was a causation or what, but like I found more answers because of that. So I think just making sure that you do that first, um, and then going from kind of what are, what we've been saying, right? Like be kind to yourself, be patient, lean on, on your kind of your tribe, your people, um, and, and just keep, keep going, right. Keep trying. Um, and if, you know, for my case, right in the end, it, it that piece, it was time to, to close that chapter, then moving on to something else and, you know, being passionate a, about a new venture, right. But like, keep putting one foot in front of the other, like you're living, this is, this is not the end. Like you're going to keep thriving and it may not be in swimming. It may be in something else or it may be in swimming and, and you keep going. So, um, just know that you're not alone and like all of us are here and the community is huge. So you're not going at this alone. You have a massive tribe, uh, behind you to, to help you through it. That's that's great. Thank you. Um, Tatiana, you've returned to competitive sport. Are you on an anticoagulant? I am. Um, I both I've returned to competitive sport and I'm on Xarelto and I'm 20 milligrams, um, which is a therapeutic dose. And yes, that was a part that was a little also a little scary. <laughs> but again, I was very honest and open with the doctors and I asked, is this okay? And we informed the staff at the, all the marathons and we've informed all the staff for Team USA. So anytime I travel at world championships or at the Paralympic games, they know that if anything comes up um, that they'll take it and uh, right away and 
check me out for another another blood clot potentially. So they're all well aware and still training and competing just fine. Bravo. That's awesome. That's a whole different pep that we'll do on uh, <laughs> on yeah. you know, exercising and competing on an, on an anticoagulant. Uh, um, and, and I would just say, if there are athletes out there uh, and you are uh, having a blood clot, to have this conversation with your provider because you know if this is important to you, you know, really discussing how how to make this work for you and your in your life, and really thinking about what your lifestyle is and how how to make it work. And that's why it's important to have a team around you that you really are connected to, to have those type of conversations. Um, absolutely agree. So I'm going to ask one more question and then Rachel, grab a question or two. Um, uh, do either of you follow a strict diagnosis or did you follow a strict diet after the diagnosis of your blood clots? And what does a, a day look like for you in terms of your diet? I asked when I was first diagnosed, I asked if I needed to follow a strict diet because I knew on Coumadin, you have to have a very strict um, diet and you have to be checked weekly. And I was like, that is not the program I want to be on because I can't do it. <laughs> I just like, I, I just couldn't do it. So I was like, don't put me on that. That will not work for me. So I was like, what are the other options? And I was on fragment shots and then I was also on Eliquis, which actually had a reverse reaction. And so I think that's why I got the clot 10 years later. Oh. And now I'm on Xeralto. Um, and I, it's really important to get in your, you know, your leafy greens, but again, talk to your doctor, depending on what medicine that you're on. And again, I just want to make sure that for me, uh, my iron is good. So my diet really revolves a lot around my iron and I can eat leafy greens. So of course I add a bunch of leafy greens to my diet, mm -hmm. but I eat a lot during training. So <laughs> I follow like a 3000 calorie diet. So I think it's, uh, I have to always keep, I'm always eating. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Katie. Uh, I would say, I mean, I was pretty swimming now I'm pretty dialed in to nutrition, but just more in kind of having a balance of everything. Um, I mean, luckily I, I, Zarelto has always been the medication that I've been prescribed very fortunate with that. Um, so there's been no restrictions in that way. Um, but you know, Saturday let loose, eat what I want Every, the rest of the week. I'm pretty strict of just lots of protein, lots of vegetables. Um, and, you know, usually just complex, complex carbohydrates, nothing crazy. Um, but I definitely am very, very cognizant of that. Um, I will say marathon training is awesome for being able to eat. Like I used to eat when I swam, <laughs> <laughs> that's about the only thing that I like about it, but, um, yeah, like I, I work out every day. So, um, I too also like to eat still. <laughs> and, and I would just say, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, it's not just diet. It's, you know, many things, including sleep, which is hard for people who have just experienced a blood clot, because I know I didn't sleep normally because I would wake up and I would be stressed out and I would go back to sleep or I was uncomfortable and I was in pain at certain times. And so I think, you know, trying to get enough sleep is really important and obviously hydrating uh, too. Yeah. I was going to say two things. I was going to say absolutely important to be hydrated, especially with the exercise because dehydration can, can increase your risk of getting blood clots. And then the other thing is both of you mentioned when I mean, you're world athletes, uh, and so you're in amazing shape and amazing weight. It's really important to maintain a healthy weight because we know that obesity is a major contributor to blood clots. Uh, and so again, kind of going back to that exercise. So if you've had a blood clot, uh, it's important to get back into the exercise to maintain a healthy weight. Uh, so hydration, healthy weight. Um, and then if, you know, another big risk is smoking. So if people are smoking really important mm -hmm. to quit and then stress, we know that stress and inflammation can actually increase, um, risk as well. So really managing stress. And I tell a lot of people, you know, meditation, I even tell people acupuncture, I have a lot of my patients that will do acupuncture, but just realizing how to, how to manage that stress. Um, I think that maybe the last one last question, or I don't know how many questions, but um, I was wondering how each of you cope with the worry of recurrence. How do you, how do you talk to yourself about that? <laughs> What's your self-talk? 
Well, I had a reoccurrence, so <laughs> for another one, I should there say. There it is. <laughs> like it, it what is your self talk? How do you? Me. So now that I'm on a therapeutic dose of Zeralto, I'm like, well, it's not going to happen. So we're we're just okay. Um, but yeah, I had the reoccurrence, and so when it happened, I actually was very shocked um, because I was on eloquence but I had the reverse reaction and I started to get like rashes Mm. when I was on it so that's when I knew like something like was possibly like wrong um and uh so I think just keep managing it seeing your doctor routinely like going to them every single year and getting your your blood work done monthly, checking that D dimer and making sh- so be proactive about it um, and look out for any symptoms. If you're on whatever medication that you're on for that reoccurrence, that could be possible. Like I had. I'll share. Uh, so I have been I guess I have this feeling of Leslie, like is going to yell at me, but um, I had this feeling of thinking like, okay, this happened. It was unprovoked. And like, not this feeling of like being invincible, but like, kind of like, like, there's no way it's ever going to happen. You know, like I just, and like, it's a terror, like, I'm just being super real with everyone. Like it's a terrible way to be. Um, And I recently, I like, I've gone, I've certainly gone to doctors and, but after I kind of went on this like tangent of getting my, you know, getting my files to everybody and no one could find anything. I kind of went to this like, okay, well, like no one's gonna, no one's gonna find anything. So why try? You know, I really went into that kind of period. Um, and recently have found a new uh, hematologist and because I've had some really bad experiences. Like when Leslie says like fire your doctor, if you need to fire your doctor, if you need to. Um, and I've had a really amazing experience, um, with that person and have actually now have like a plan moving forward because kids, I'm not pregnant. This is not my announcement, but like, you know, kids are in the kids are in the near future. And, and so I have kind of taken this turn to being way more dialed in and in a really, really safe spot. And that's because people like Leslie and people like Doc, Dr. Rosofsky. And so, um, that's my experience of just like not doing the right thing. Like don't do what I did, <laughs> but just being real that that's kind of how I felt. And I've gone into this stage of, you know, being a lot more safe and I'm very happy that I'm, I followed that path. Yeah. We're very and I, happy we are too. Uh, yes, Katie. Excellent. And I think Katie, you make the point. I mean, in people that have a blood clot where we can identify kind of a major reason why they got the blood clot, they broke a leg, they just had surgery, something like that. Those people generally don't need to be on long-term blood thinner, but when people, when when we can't identify an underlying cause, oftentimes those people have a much higher risk of getting a blood clot if they stop their anticoagulant. And so, and that's probably 50% of the time. And so in those people, we really do sit down and kind of weigh the risks and benefits. You know, what's the risk of you getting a blood clot if we stop your blood thinner versus your risk of bleeding if we keep you on it? Which one is higher? Which one is lower? And if you're one of those people that uh, there was no identifiable cause, in general, we tend to keep people on longer term. Even if you're one of the people where it was provoked, this is really important, that in any other high clotting risk situation, you want to be put back, you will often be put back on a blood thinner, so an anticoagulant. So these are really important conversations to have with your provider, um, just so that you know, you know, what are my risks? What do I need to do? How long do you need to be on this? And, and if I go off of it, what does that mean? And when do I need to go back on it and really be very clear um, as to, as to you know, what, what you need to do and really understand your risks, I think is important. And then also, if you've had a blood clot yourself, just know that, you know, your family members might be at risk of getting a blood clot. So to really let your whole family know, there could be something underlying that you've got inherited, maybe not, but just having a family member can put you at higher risk. So again, just, you know, and that's what we want to do. We want to spread the word about the risks of blood clots, the signs and symptoms, and that, you know, you have to seek medical attention if you, if you get that. And so Both of your stories have been so incredibly inspiring and just thank you. I mean, you've just been so um, vulnerable in sharing how you're really feeling and all your feelings. And I I think this is going to help so many people just listening to your stories. And gracious. You've both been incredibly gracious with your time. So we're going to, we're going to end it here because we have not been gracious. We have taken more time than we said we were going to. 
um, we just want to thank you. Uh, you're amazing women, people, and um, want you to come back and continue to advocate. We we need your voices so that we can really raise awareness because it's so needed. And just wanted to say thank you to both of you for just being so incredibly gracious tonight. And thank very you. sorry that we weren't able to get to everyone's questions, um, but we tried. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you to the MC. You guys are awesome. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.